thank you so much for having me here today. I'm excited to present my research. Um, it's very much in progress, so I really would like your feedback on it. Um, it's, it's pretty rough right now, and I, I uh, consider it to be kind of like a pilot study. So um, I hope to get some feedback from you today about it. Um, Okay, so I'm currently finishing a degree in France um, that I've been working on for the last four years, uh, long distance, and this is the final part of my degree, is this memoir, it's a thesis. And um, so I chose to study Chinese students in France. I thought it would be something different than study Chinese students in the U.S. Um, in a different environment. Um, and so what I'd like to do first is just give you some background of international students in France in general. And I found this website that has some good statistics on it. So France is the third most popular host destination for international students. Um, in the past, they've been mostly from North African countries like Tunisia or Algeria. And I thought Aziz's presentation was very interesting. Um, because they're, you'll see. <laughs> um, but in France, there's currently, in last year, or 2011-2012, there were currently, there were 288,000 international students. Um, Morocco, China, Algeria, Tunisia, and Senegal. And as you can see by the chart, um, China has overtaken Algeria, which is huge. <laughs> China is now, they, they're 10% of the international students So, um, so I was looking into, you know, what are the incentives, incentives for students to go to France? I wanted to find out what that would be. So, um, for the lower achieving Chinese students, uh, currently there's not just not enough places in Chinese universities for them, in the prestigious universities. It's very competitive. They take the Gaokao exam, the college entrance exam, not all of them get into the best universities as many of you who are Chinese probably know. So, um, uh, also there's a 30% unemployment rate um, as of 2009 for students graduating with a bachelor's degree in China. So, it's very competitive for them. Um, so, they often go abroad, and in France they say se faire doré, which means to bronze yourself, to become you know, more prestigious. Um, for higher achieving Chinese students, France is also very attractive. Um, there's been a 297% increase since 2009 of English taught master's programs in France. They're going crazy over there. Um, <laughs> so um, there's 123 total programs. They're mostly in business and engineering. Um, according to Campus France, which is uh, an organization that works with embassies, China, the French Embassy in China. Um, there's a lot more French Chinese business and engineering partnerships and scholarships. There are obligatory internships for all of the students, so all of the students are guaranteed an internship in France, which is difficult for them to get in the U.S. Um, diploma validation is good in both countries. It's the fifth most powerful country doing business in China. There are many French companies in China now. Um, Lack of French students at the doctoral level in the sciences, so they rely on Chinese students to come in and fill those places. Um, also, <laughs> look at the tuition. <laughs> you can't compete with that. Um, <laughs> you can't compete. My degree, for my degree, I pay 150 euros for the year, plus a small 200 euros for the university fees, so it's not, almost nothing. It's your book cost here, right? So. <laughs> um, but the French, the French taxes pay for these students, and this is why this is controversial for international students. Okay, so um, French instruction in China, I was interested in what was going on with French instruction in China. Um, study of French has tripled since 2000, um, um, ever since, let's see, ever since um, the French president went to visit, Jacques Chirac went to visit, and ever since then, starting to pull up. So there are probably more businesses going into China after that point. Um, 
they're mostly in the classes of French are mostly in Southeast China, which are the more affluent areas of China. Um, French is taught only in 175 universities. There are only 500 native Chinese speak, teaching French. These are rough numbers. This is from 2008. I, I couldn't find very much information on this. It was difficult to find, but um, so you take with this with a grain of salt. But and then 170 native French instructors. Um, there are several Alliance Francaise um, in major cities, but they cost a lot of money. It's about 600 euros. Um, I can't quite remember, but it costs quite a bit of money um, to do that. So only the more affluent students can afford to do that. Um, this was very interesting. There's only seven secondary schools in China that offer French at all. And those are probably, some of them, private schools. So it's, it's difficult to study French until you get to the university. Um, the theoretical framework of my study, um, I looked at a lot of Horowitz's studies, Elaine Horowitz in Texas, um, on learner beliefs, and she says that former experience in learning languages and culture background affects beliefs about language learning. Um, and then Yang and Kim internalized beliefs about the L2 are linked with the L2 environment. And so I'm, I'm very interested in the beliefs, the learner beliefs these students have going into France. Um, the learning environment affects strategy use, and views on learner autonomy and teacher role may change as a result of studying abroad. So um, Amuzi and Linky, I'm modeling my study after this after this study, Amuzi and Linky, um, that they did with international students coming to the US. So, um, they're from Michigan State. So then I looked and tried to see, okay, what studies have there been on learner beliefs? Um, there are several studies, none in France, that I could find. Um, several Anglophone countries, several in the United States, on Asian and Near East students. Non-Anglophone countries, they have Taiwan, Korea, China, Turkey, Lebanon. Um, I couldn't find almost anything in Europe at all, besides Britain. Um, so I did my data collection in Nancy, France, which is in the northeast part of France. That's where I lived, where I lived for three years. And um, so my research questions um, are, what beliefs do Chinese students have about learning French before and after arriving in France? And, oh, something happened to my number. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but, and then there are, are there any differences in beliefs between Chinese students living less than two years and more than two years in France? So I want to know if there's a difference with time range. And then the third question is sociocultural factors. Um, what kinds of things affect their beliefs? Okay, so here's the school where I did most of my research. I worked here. Um, this is a grande école. Um, it's a prestigious university. Uh, you have to pass an entrance exam to get in. It's mostly engineering, computer science students. Um, they work very hard. They pay a lot of money. They have to pay 600 euros a year <laughs> to go there. So it's very prestigious. Um, so the participants of my study, um, I had a very difficult time finding people because it was summer. Um, and you know, in France in the summer, everything shuts down. But. <laughs> I uh, went back to visit, so I thought I would try to collect some data, and uh, I managed to find 19 Chinese students. <laughs> this is a struggle. But I had nine females and 10 males. Um, the age range is because I have mostly students, but I had a few people who were already out of university, and I just thought I'd interview them too, because they had been to university in France, so I did that too. Um, uh, most of them were engineering or computer science students at a Grand École. Um, I had a, one girl who was uh, in visual communication at the Beaux-Arts School, and I had a, some outliers in other schools, but most of them were in the Grand École. Um, they had studied French before coming to France, three, uh, three months to two years of French study. And um, that was 
the range. So here, um, I know these numbers look kind of funny, but I'm not sure how else to do it right now. <laughs> but I did a, an early group and a late group. Um, and so the mean age of everyone was around 20, age 22. And the months of instruction average was about six. And the length of residence was five months in France. So that was the amount of time that they were in France at the moment that I interviewed them, okay? Or that they did the questionnaire. And then the late group, people with more than two years, um, the mean age was 34. Months of French instruction were eight. And um, length of residence in France was 10. That was in years for the residence. So um, the instrument I used, I had an online questionnaire. So some of the data came in after I left France. Um, I was only there for three weeks doing this. Um, uh, I used Qualtrics software. I had, I had translated the questionnaire into French, so it was in English and in French for them, so they could choose whichever language was more comfortable for them. The bio data um, was collected in the questionnaire, their background data. Um, learner belief questionnaire I modeled after Cotterall and Horowitz to determine the learner's perceived beliefs before and after living in France. So the, um, I could, well, I could try to show it later if you want, but the questions are modeled so that, um, you know, when in China, I believe this, in France, I believe this, and the questions are um, repeated so that they have to respond to both situations, when in China and in France. So, um, uh, um, in the questionnaire, I measured these four variables, um, self-efficacy, they're belief in the ability to learn. Uh, so an example of one of the questionnaire items is, in France, I am confident that I will be able to speak French well. So they would, uh, it was a Likert scale, they would choose um, the appropriate response for them. Learner autonomy, individual responsibility to learn language, difficulty of language learning. Uh, when I studied French in China, I believed that French is a difficult language. So they just have to, it's, it's self-reflection, they have to think back um, and determine that. Um, nature of language learning, perceived importance of instruction and teacher's role in learning. Um, in France, I believe that my success for learning languages depends on what the teacher does in the classroom. And so I wanted to see if, you know, in their, if they perceive any differences in the way they're instructed in China versus the way they're instructed in the U.S. or in, ah, in France, <laughs> not the U.S. Okay, so my analysis is very, very slim, okay? I didn't find very many significant results because I had so few people. Um, I tried, I was basically just playing with statistics a little bit, but I tried an independent t-test and um, to examine, examine differences between groups, between groups, and I didn't find anything there. But um, the paired sample t-test um, to find significance between beliefs in China versus beliefs in France. So I had at home versus study abroad environments. And um, both, both of those groups reported that they felt more stronger beliefs in learner autonomy after living in France. Learner autonomy, they felt an increase. Okay, um, interview questions. These were the interview questions I used. I, uh, I asked them. So just look at those quickly. greater need for independent learning strategies. So a lot of them were using, you know, watching news programs on TV. These were things they reported to me. Finding Chinese websites to read course material in Chinese. So they were struggling. Um, memorizing lists of words at home. Difference in teaching style in France um, was an issue.
issue for some of them asking classmates or teacher to clarify info. And so they would act, they weren't used to doing that in China and they were forced to do that in France more because they couldn't understand on their own. Um, studying in English was often more comfortable than in French because they had had more experience, more, more time with that. So. Um, I asked them about the image France had in China. I was curious about that. And it's interesting, they said before they thought it was such a romantic place, such a great life, everything's perfect. And then they get there and they realize, you know, there are some issues that we're going to have to deal with. There's, you know, French students. Um, I thought this was interesting. The young French people are similar to Chinese youth in that they prefer to stay in their own circles. My classmates were curious about me at first, but it has been difficult to integrate into the department, not only because I'm in Chinese, but because there are only two women. So she was in an engineering school, so she had several difficulties there. Um, why do Chinese students choose to study in France? The lower cost of education, internship. Um, this was interesting. I changed all their names, by the way. These are not their real names. Um, in the US and UK, one must pass exams like IELTS or TOEFL. Some Chinese students are not good at English. France is important in China, and French is easier than German and more similar to English. So there it is in a nutshell. <laughs> you heard it from him. <laughs> Um, future implications. Um, France 24 stated that international students are required to have only 500 hours of French study to get a student visa. That's three to six months of intensive study. Um, social integration. So I thought Aziz's comment was interesting that it's so easy, that it's getting more difficult for immigration because it seems like it's getting easier for Chinese students. So I don't know if it's different for Chinese or what's going on. <laughs> Is it different for Chinese? Yeah, I think a lot of it's religion too. So. Religion? Yeah. Oh, oh my god. Okay. Um, so social integration in the essay environment um, is probably an issue. Academic consequences are going to be a big issue. Negative beliefs about language learning. Use of the L1 Chinese more than the L2, probably likely, which I, I witnessed. I had Chinese students there. Um, and French higher education policy changes are going to be required for international students. It's going to be a big problem. Okay, so I have several limitations. Um, studying the same group of people over two different time periods would be a better idea. Um, getting, uh, I had an age gap issue. Some of the people weren't in university at the time that I interviewed them. Um, it was a small sample. There may have been some language barriers because some of the interviews I did more in French and some more in English, and we're both speaking our second language, so there might have been some language barrier issues with comprehension. Um, and self-reported data of past events is unreliable sometimes. So those were a lot of limitations. Um, so I hope to try to replicate this um, in an American university, hopefully here. Um, but I would really like to do more research in a French context and explore this further because I think there needs to be more um, attention put in this area of research. Um, if you're interested, this is, an, this is the video that got me interested in this topic when I was looking for a topic to do, so I can email it to you if you're interested in, in that. Um, and you can get a visual of the students in the classroom. Thank you very much.